Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 729. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's April 30th, 2022. Welcome. We're glad you made it. I, you guys have probably struggled a lot to get to this episode. Well, George and I have. We've gone through a lot to get to this episode, but uh, we're here. We're going to sit down and talk about the news, bring you some quick health updates on uh, Kevin's life and George's life, and uh, ask for your prayers. Um, we missed a couple episodes because I went for a bike ride, not this week, last week, not this Thursday, but Thursday or four, and did my standard 40-mile ride, came back, and I was I went to the bathroom, and what urinated out was the wrong color. I went to the ER and they said, you have a kidney stone. They hospitalized me for two days before they could finally find a surgeon who was able to take it out. Good news is the uh, kidney stone is out. Uh, I have more in the kidney apparently, but they're not uh, troublesome yet. They're going to take them out next fall. I also have a, a gallbladder stone. Yay. And uh, all this uh, time in the hospital has set off uh, my hidden anxiety. So. Uh, my blood pressure has been all over the place. I've been snapping at people and I'm just not the calm Kevin you knew two weeks ago. So please take some time this week and, and lift me up in your prayers that uh, I could return to calm Kevin. I like calm Kevin. My wife likes calm Kevin. Calm Kevin's a nice guy. <laughs> uh, doesn't uh, need the uh, the beer at 8 p.m. So George, how you doing? Well, I'm being pastoral to my friend Kevin. I heard from my wife, who heard from his wife, that Kevin had hemorrhoids. So we, what? I, well, yeah, I mean, uh, so I was all set to, uh, we were going to go down and visit you, and we said, well, we should bring something to Kevin, and we passed a Chick-fil-A. Uh, what well, should we bring the sandwich, because hospital food's no good, or, I said, no, bad. I mean, if he's got, if he's got problems there let's get him one of these pillows and uh, we got there and sure enough Kevin would rather have had a Chick-fil-A sandwich than an instrument for something he's not suffering from I so and, and we forgot to take a picture normally you and I get together we take a picture uh, you know I was certainly in my my uh, hospital gown you know didn't you this hospital is in had huge hospital rooms and I was the only one in it you know, that, this that was, was a magnificent house. Yeah. Brand new, brand new uh, suburbs of Tampa. Just architecturally, services are just beautiful. My goodness, it's 30 years, 25 years ago, I worked as a hospital chaplain. We had nothing like this. My that goodness. Uh, now, Kevin, I, have, were, I haven't got the bill. <laughs> well, the. the Here's the wonderful thing that you can go in. Uh, you're, you're not a local, but yeah. you know you're, you're seasonal. Mm -hmm. But you can go in with a complaint, and you can find a top-notch doctor, and have this taken care of in a beautiful facility, and basically be in and out in two or three days. Which ten years ago you would be in a hospital for a week uh, on some sort of thinners for the, the stones and everything, and then. Mm -hmm trying to find a, a, a kidney surgeon my goodness that? just you know I think the Lord was with you Kevin throughout this process because you weren't in any pain and you could have just ignored I would have ignored it yeah uh, <laughs> it just the doctors were surprised that I had such a big stone stuck in my tube and I wasn't in any pain I've had kidney stones all my life uh, I've had painful ones I've been able to pass 99% uh, of them uh, it it's one of the great uh, genetic conditions my father has passed on to me. The gallbladder comes from my mom. Thanks, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You know, uh, so it, if God, I call, you know, but God, God was really there with you, Kevin, the entire time. I mean, uh, uh, and it didn't hurt that uh, we had a whole bunch of people across the internet and across Florida pray for you. Mm -hmm and god has provided look at you right now you're in key west florida for goodness sakes yeah. what a terrible place to recuperate <laughs> we parked a uh, uh, sasquatch right here on the shore uh we're facing uh the bay off key west here uh, kudju bay 
Uh, it's beautiful. But George, blue eyes, sensitive eyes, uh, brand new eyes, a little bright down here. It's like being on top of a mountain. Just the, the intensity of the sun here in the keys. So well, you, you know, want, you know Kevin, some new we're sunglasses. at the stage of life where we've got to complain about something. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, the, well, you went, you went no. to the doctor this week too. Yeah, we, if, if they're going to pray for me, they can pray for George. Oh, uh, it's exciting. I have two doctors vying to see who can spend the most time and money on my body. Um, but uh, I have had uh, exhaustion and anemia. Mm -hmm. And I went and saw two doctors, and I'm going to have a, a uh, the gastroenterologist and the cardiologist, and each have come up with their own reason why I'm it's this way. So I'm going to have a, a, a colonoscopy, then an endoscopy, and then at the same time I'm going to have a, a cardiac uh, outpatient procedure um, to basically uh, I have atrial. Uh, a, uh, a heart flutter mm -hmm. and they're going to do an outpatient surgery not surgery an outpatient procedure to Besson's push the electric restart button and get the sinus rhythm in the right 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 way but I'm really excited and uh, uh, that we know what the issue is that uh, yeah yeah for it's not just my being old fat and lazy that I'm so tired <laughs> well I mean the cool thing is that it gives you know Medical health care gives us another day to serve the Lord, uh, mm -hmm. to provide you guys with news, be transparent uh, in this strange times. It, it was very hard for me not to record uh, when the South Carolina decision came out. I wanted to call Alan Haley. I wanted to get on the phone. But the only clothes that they let me wear were the ho hospital gown. <laughs> and I left the recording equipment back at the, at the rig. So we, we need to cover some news. Um, it's going to be kind of, we did a little pre-show here, so we, we know what we're talking about. But the f first story this week, George, is South Carolina. The South, uh, South Carolina Supreme Court has come down with a second decision and a final decision on the property uh, for the churches that left the Episcopal Church. Who gets the churches? And you you read the decision. Um, it's long. And they don't reference law very much. They reference the previous decision and they reference how to how are we going to get ourselves out of this jam that we got ourselves into in the first place and george what how are they going to get themselves out of that jam alan haley described this in a very good article which you can find on anglican inc as a south carolina court but with an allusion to the story of solomon and the two women of dividing the baby mm -hmm. rather than finding the true owners so the final decision was that they basically wanted to split the issue and 14 churches are going to be returned to the episcopal church uh, diocese of south carolina and the rest will be held owned by the anglican diocese of south carolina and the argumentation that sort of divides this and that is rather specious it's Alan Haley points out that this is the decision done to preserve the reputation of the South Carolina Supreme Court who messed up the first time round with a judge who should have recused themselves and with five opinions that were contradictory. This time around they came up with a single opinion that all signed off on but really didn't have any reference to law or justice or the facts. So the neither side would be fully satisfied because neither side's theories were accepted instead that they just came up with an arbitrary way to divide up the, uh, the spoils so to speak mm -hmm. so the, the camp christopher i think goes to the episcopal church and 14 parishes do some of them are quite prominent old saint andrews in charleston for instance now what beautiful does this that's a beautiful mean? church you know now, it to to go read, do read Alan's article to go into the legal niceties. Uh, he comes off as being very frustrated in this article. And if you're a really good lawyer and you see bad judging, um, it's it, it's discouraging. It is, this because is a discouraging case. It, it, it in some points his article reads like, "What's the point of all this?" We, you know, 
clearly Paul tells us not to to go to court with our issues as Christians. We, we know that, but this is beyond ridiculous. This type of decision um, that there is common law that we understand in property rights in uh, freedom association that we have it through our constitution. South Carolina had been down this road before with the EMEA, uh, with uh, St. Paul's, uh, uh, what's Paulie's you know, All Saints Island. Paulie's Island. All Saints Paulie's Island. They, they've been down the road before. And so I, I can see Alan's frustration. I'm frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. I'm sure the Episcopal Church is frustrated. They want it at all. They only get half. You know, how do we go forward from here, George? Well, I look at it as, as an opportunity. We have two new players on the scene. Chip Edgar is the bishop of the Anglican Church in South Carolina, and Bishop Woodliffe Stanley, I've forgotten her first name, is the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese. No reconciliation. Uh, this all started with Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, and sort of take no prisoners, burn, destroy uh, the opposition. Uh, she almost was a caricature of the Borg, he will be assimilated. Well, it was uh, a bit, but she had a, like the Borg, uh, an ultimate leader too, in uh, the late David Booth Beers. Yeah, there yeah, was the influence there. Uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was a weak presiding bishop in that she was not very experienced in Episcopal leadership or as an Episcopalian. She was a convert from Catholicism. And unlike uh, uh, Frank Griswold or even Michael Curry, she had she did not have a mind of her own and was led by her lawyers to do things that the lawyers thought were great but were not what a religious leader should do or a pastor should do well let's cut to the press what does this all mean we don't know in other words does this mean that old saint andrew's people including families who have been there for 300 years are all going to be dispossessed and the minister fired and this and that um or are they going to start a new lawsuit i don't know um what's in their hearts they certainly need to figure out what happens next but it, it's to me was interesting this was the letters written by the two bishops after the decision came down they were both pastoral they weren't triumphalistic they weren't they didn't recycle the, all the old accusations against either side. So perhaps there's an opportunity here for, if I don't believe, rec reunion, but no. reconciliation. In other words, it could be, okay, the Episcopal Diocese owns this building, but you pay us a dollar a year and continue to maintain it and keep the upkeep and this and that. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But there's an opportunities for to display Christian charity. Uh, Which we in, saw in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. The Episcopal Diocese that, of Pittsburgh came to an agreement with the Acta Diocese. And we actually saw it from Jack Iker in Fort Worth, where Jack Iker said to those who wanted to stay, stay. Um, but the again, the lawyers from New York said it was all or nothing. And they rolled the dice in Texas, and they came up nothing, the National Episcopal Church. Um, here they've got a split decision. Um, maybe there is an opportunity for char charity of heart to be shown, because the damage this is going to do. I have several good friends. My senior warden used to be a member of Old St. Andrews before they moved to Florida. And she says, you know, this decision and will just destroy the reputation of the Episcopal Church in Charleston. Um, you just cannot treat these churches as sort of hotels on a monopoly board. Mm -hmm. um, they have characters and personas and but this, I, I, I come back to this, Kevin, and this may be wishful thinking, this may be naive, but I do believe that it's a good thing that we're finally, that there's no more uncertainty about what's going to happen. We now know what the facts are, and now we have to respond accordingly in light of 
firm and fixed principles. Even if they're not good principles, even if they're not good facts, we now know how to respond. We do. Now, part of me is like, you know, Kevin, George, the, the makeup of the Supreme Court is so much different than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago when you would take a church property uh, case to the court and they would say, we don't want to deal with it yet. It, is there enough? To, this is probably a better question for uh, A.S. Haley. Um, is this a time that you would want to approach a, a conservative court with, you know, property rights in South Carolina and they could finally take care of this as a, a national uh, canon for once? You know, uh, um, you don't have to answer that, but I may want to ask Alan Haley in an interview if I, I get a chance this week. Um, you know, is, is this a chance or, or is this just, just let's let's work it out here? Yeah. Well, Alan can give you the odds, but how the process would work is that this opinion can be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, mm -hmm. as was done in the uh, uh, Virginia Parish cases. And uh, so far, the uh, national, the Supreme Court has declined to hear all of these property cases for the Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and so on. Yeah, it's something I don't want to touch, but the court's different now, and I'm just, I'm just musing in my mind because no, I don't want to take anything down further to court, but I would like to have an answer that's greater than the division of fifty different states and fifty different answers. You know, that's just Kevin George. Let's move on to our next story in the. Oh, okay, this is kind of a, a quirky story because it's not really Anglican. Um, Elon Musk bought Twitter. Twitter explodes. The left explodes. How dare we have free speech? Uh, darn it all. Uh, I signed up for my first Twitter account. I now have uh, uh, my own Twitter account. It's called Sasquatch RV, or you put the little at sign in front of there and you can uh, f follow my travels as uh, Jill and I travel in, in Sasquatch. And so I'm like, this is cool because uh, it was all a lie. For five or 10 or 15 years, you have been lied to about the statistics on places like Twitter, how many people liked an Elon Musk versus a Obama versus a, uh, a conservative uh, Trump. They skewed the numbers. Elon Musk bought it. He said, stop skewing the numbers. And people were more popular than they thought they were. And people like Obama and OAC were less popular than she thought by thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know if it affects uh, Anglican Inc. or Anglican TV, but it was all a lie. And it's not just Twitter that's lying to you. When I go on Netflix and it says the, the, the top trending video is this gay lifestyle video, it's a lie. It's not the top trending video. They're skewing the numbers to put this type of content in front of you, in front of you, so that you just think it's natural and it's, it's stuff like that. When you go on to other places and they tell you this is the top trending thing, you're being lied to. It's not. They've skewed numbers. They've posted different. Uh, they've raised non-headline news to be headline news uh, to transform how America thinks. And Elon Musk has used money, financial influence to buy Twitter and kind of in his in his mind set the record straight. Is Elon Musk above reproach? No. Does he have some ties that may bind him to his uh, future endeavors in free speech? I think China would be one George. I, I he has all these fa he has all these factories in Shanghai and in China yeah. making Tesla cars. Yeah. He has, uh, his, he, he can't really cross the Chinese government uh, too hard, or his uh, it'll do wonders of good for his Twitter investment, but it'll really mess him up with Tesla. Rare earth materials needed for these uh, batteries for these cars are almost a monopoly by China at this stage. So he's got to tread carefully of what he can and can't do on the China question. But all you ever wanted to know about Hunter Biden's laptop, you can read now on Twitter. Yeah, you can. It's, uh, I mean, it, the and I, I should have made full disclosure. I made uh, ten or fifteen thousand dollars on the the Twitter um, transaction. I had bought into Twitter around Christmas, 
when I heard some rumors. And so I, I need to be fully um, uh, factual on that. I, I, I do had, did have a vested interest in Twitter. My stock has been purchased by Elon Musk. Thank you. Um, so in as such, it's interesting to see the reaction of people who told us this was all about free speech when it really never was, George. I've never seen the left. Uh, I know more about Elon Musk, who is kind of just been politically active for two or three months, than I do uh, President Joe Biden, who's been active for 47 years in politics. Because the Washington Post has gone after him, CNN has gone, everybody, Fox News went after him. I mean, just, it's, <laughs> the guys are like, <laughs> so we'll I just have to see. It's, it, you know, it's one of those interesting things that happened when I was in a hospital bed. And I said, oh, we need to talk about this. Well, yeah. I, think it, I think it has uh, bearings on the Anglican Episcopal world because the response reaction of the establishment to Elon Musk's purchase is akin to the worldview that we see in the establishment of the Church of England and the Episcopal Church, that they are so... They believe their own lies. Yeah. They believe their own propaganda. They, because there's no free inter, inter, interchange of ideas, and they only hear their own thoughts repeated back to them, they think that's the truth. For instance, we've had in the Episcopal Church some recent House of Bishops meetings and some meetings of the uh, Executive Council. And I dutifully report some of what they do because most of it is of no interest to anybody, really not even the Episcopal Church, but Michael Curry's telling us that the greatest threats facing the United States is from white nationalism. And we have this task force that spent three years looking into the deleterious effects on white nationalism within the Episcopal Church and what we need to do. And then at the House of Bishops meeting, they had a vote uh, uh, attacking the state of Texas for its laws that uh, forbid uh, medical uh, procedures on children who think they're transgender below a certain age, I think it's 16 or 18. So a girl who's 14 who thinks she's a boy uh, can't just have a mastectomy and have her genitalia destroyed and then when she's 22 she comes out of that phase of life and realizes what mistake it was. Well, the Episcopal Church basically passed a pro, you know, the, the House of Bishops is bought in to those lies. And if you ask me what the greatest threat facing the United States is, if we talk domestically, it's not white nationalism. Kevin, you and I live in a part of a world where we see these guys in their pickup trucks and their chin beards and uh, the, the hound dog in the back. Oh, the yeah, seriously. Flag. Uh, I go on my bike ride in Webster, Florida. I bike down to the Van Fleet Bicycle Trail, and I go by two or three houses, Confederate flags out there, hound dog under the porch, uh, beer cans strewn outside where the, the car just parked, or the, not car, the truck, um, some old cab on the back of the truck that's half fallen apart. Clearly, you know, this is stereotypical uh, redneck country, but Michael Curry, this redneck guy, is a minority, and he has no influence whatsoever. Nobody cares what he thinks except at the polls, but he has very little influence. If he's yakking and hating and, and being a racist, nobody's listening to him. And he's not, he's, not, he's not convincing other people to be racist. You might be, Michael Curry, but this gentleman isn't. Yeah. For me, the greatest threat facing our country internally uh, uh, is uh, the drugs. Um, the number of people that have died of fentanyl overdoses, who die in shootings in Chicago of black-on-black -black violence, it's gang-related, and what's driving the gang violence is the drug market. Um, the, to, to say that white nationalism is a threat in the sense of people dying and people in danger is the greatest problem facing this country when you compare it to the reality. Uh, it's a small anecdote of uh, 
Uh, I have uh, Krishna, a godchild who is an uh, inmate at the Florida Women's Prison down in Brooksville. And it's a uh, faith based prison. We have those in Florida where pr prisoners who are on good behavior can go to a prison that has faith based programs for rehabilitation and sort of re, uh, re ordering the thought processes so that when they get out they don't have don't go back in they are rehabilitated yes yes well the women's prison is going to be shut down because there's such an overflow of male prisoners in the system they've run out of space and so the faith-based prison the prisoner is going to re be redispersed from a and i'm fearful that she may have to go up to a, a, a forestry camp up in uh, the panhandle uh cutting down trees all day is not a great job for anybody let alone a young girl yeah. or down to homestead um, or to some of the tougher places that don't have these programs well, point is that all we're not been invaded by foreign gangs we just have a generation arising of young boys who the culture in which we live is so drug filled that the violence and the problems that we're having are causing a prison population explosion. And the deaths that we're seeing from these drugs, from shootings and whatnot. And to say with the straight face of the, our greatest threat and that we have to have task forces on white nationalism, it's... It's BS. Ridiculous. Okay, I'm gonna say it, BS. I, I, no, I agree. And but it, it, it's because, you know, they live in such a bubble that they hear other people tell that they, well, they mm -hmm. They watch MSNBC and hear other people tell them that uh, you know all Trump voters are white nationalist racists who hate you and this and that, um, and they believe their own lies. And the sad thing is, especially in the Northeast and other parts of the country, crime rates are through the roof. It's up two hundred percent in the New York City area. Um, violent crime is up one hundred fifty percent. They don't put them in jail. They release them on bail. Um, there was a guy who was uh, uh, attacked in his minivan, beaten to a pulp, and the guy was out in four hours. You know, uh, he, he, they didn't even put him on probation. Just booked him and uh, processed him, and out you go. Here in uh, Florida, I think they put too many nonviolent criminals in long prison terms. It's my humble opinion. I'm new to Florida. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I well, think we, you know, my, my, my godchild is serving a five year sentence for stealing $800. Um, okay. Uh, once again, my opinion may be shared. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, we do need uh, uh, certain reform in our criminal justice system at all levels uh, because it is so chaotic. Um, and uh, every state. Well, well, you know. Part of the good news is, Kevin, for you and me, because now I'm a property owner, our property values are going up because people from California, people from mm -hmm. New York, from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Illinois are moving to Florida because there's no income tax. There's no inheritance tax. The, the, to, do, to set up a small business is not going to cost you $100,000 a year in fees and regulations. Yeah. So we're seeing people voting with their feet in many aspects. One of the things I just saw the other day, and I couldn't believe it, so I actually had to check it. It's not that I disbelieve everything I see on the news. Florida has three million more people. I'm sorry, Florida has three million more people than the state of New York. Mm -hmm. It's now larger than New York. But the Florida government budget is half of that of the state of New York. Could just allow that to sort of sink in. Florida accomplishes just as much as New York does in quality of living, the roads, uh, schools, this and that, with spending half the money. Uh, it's I, insane. It is insane. And, and this is just an FYI to people who are coming to uh, Key West. Sometime in the second week of April, they start digging up the streets to repave them. You want to come here before April. I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, I, I took the, the cheap rent here so I could get a, a shoreline a spot for, for Sasquatch, but uh, all the roads are dug up in, in Key West because they had the money to repave them all. Uh, next story, we, we covered the Fort Worth uh, uh, going to Texas already. Let's uh, move on and talk about Bishop 
Mark did, McDonald. Did, did we cover Fort Worth? Going you to- mentioned the loyal that. Uh, well, okay, let's do the. In case we didn't, our four story today is uh, the Fort Worth loyalists are going to the Diocese of Texas. Bishop Scott Mayer, the provisional bishop of uh, North Texas, has announced that the loyalists in the Episcopal Church from Diocese of Fort Worth mm-hmm. are going. They're not going to make it as they're not going to try to make it on their own as a diocese. They're going to fold back into the Diocese of Texas. Mm-hmm. Now, which is unusual because Diocese of Fort Worth was split out of the Diocese of Dallas. Now, originally, all of Texas was the Diocese of Texas. <laughs> so, that. that's, so you can go back for where you came from. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that the thinking is that uh, Fort Worth would not go into Dallas because Dallas is too conservative. And there is a uh, there are conservative parts of the Diocese of Texas, but there are also liberal parts. And the liberals in Fort Worth feel more at home with their brethren in Austin uh, than they do with uh, their brethren just down the highway in Dallas. Mm-hmm. So it, it's interesting that, well, I think it's a smart move that they're not just going to, they're consolidating, but we're going to see consolidations. We're seeing that Wisconsin, the three, di- uh, with the three dioceses, Eau Claire, Fond du Lac, and Milwaukee, are uh, working on being unified one, into yeah. one diocese. Yeah. Um, we're seeing that across the country where so many dioceses are unable to make a go of it. Um, it's, it's Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, yeah, the, the Dakotas. Uh, you know, not just the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church is being wiped out uh, in parts of Wisconsin, Minnesota too. Um, there, I, I've, I've there won, some... well, I have one Lutheran pastor who serves five churches. What he goes week to week to week to week in Minnesota. It's, I think, also a geographic issue because the Diocese of the Great Lakes in the ACNA is having troubles. Sure. Uh, in that um, they have a lot of, well, they have a number of uh, small churches that were founded by retired Episcopal clergy and other clergy, and they've not grown large enough to be able to support stipendary priests. So when the guy who started the church at 72 hits 82, yeah. They're not going to be able to make it uh, without a new non spendary priest. So that part of the country is having difficulty uh, across the denominational board. Okay, now we do Bishop Mark McDonald. <laughs> uh, interesting, he's an American bishop, works in Canada, or used to. What's the story, George? Well, Mark McDonald was the Episcopal Bishop of Alaska. Uh, he uh, is actually on the conservative side of a number of issues mm-hmm. of uh, human sexuality and whatnot. But he's also of a Native American or First Nation as the same Canada ancestry. And he's pretty, uh, pretty aggressive on those lines. Well, he was invited to go from the Diocese of Alaska to become the indigenous bishop for Canada. And that position moved over time, and now, and eventually, he became the Archbishop of the Indigenous Church of Indigenous People within the Anglican Church of Canada. And Mark, who's in his mid sixties, uh, I think, shocked the world when an accusation of sexual misconduct was brought against him, and he admitted it, and he was deposed from holy orders by the primate, Archbishop Linda Nichols. I mean, this was a shocker, because Mark had a good reputation. Yeah, he was out there on some, you know, some issues, but he never had the reputation of being somebody whose hands were, you know, in the wrong place or... Well, uh, but let's just, my bit, my shock was not with Mark. It's with the, the Diocese of Canada holding somebody, or the, uh, the Anglican Communion uh, province of Canada holding somebody accountable for sexual misconduct. That's what I was. What? Okay, yeah, Mark, you did bad. Please repent. Return to the fold, um, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, allow ministry to those you've hurt. But Canada, you found this offensive enough, <laughs> really? So whatever. 
All right. Next. Well, I, uh, let, let, let me just uh, put yeah. in a uh, supposition. Mark has the integrity that when confronted with its accusation, he admitted the truth sure. and resigned. Yeah. So I'm not saying that this may have happened, but if he wa if they want if he wanted this to be swept away, there was a good chance it could have been. Okay. But yeah. Mark played it straight. Mark McDonald played it straight. Uh, he admitted his his sin, and the con and once he admitted his sin, the consequences were pretty clear. What that would be he couldn't yeah. hold a leadership position so yeah. uh, keep him in your prayers please uh we we don't seek people be cast out we seek people be uh brought back in um that's <sighs> important all right next story i have here in the list um and it's an old story to you and i because we reported it years ago when it happened um benny hen has a nephew who is a evangelical, uh, not uh, um, a very evangelical nephew, who has been holding Benny Hinn accountable for his naming and claimant preaching. And uh, I think Benny Hinn got the hint because back in uh, 2019, he put out some articles and he did a couple speeches where he repented of what he had said before and said this type of preaching is heretical and uh, against the gospel and he would not do it again but I I never really followed up to see if he stuck with it this news has finally hit someplace we thought may have known this already so what what will give us a, a bigger uh, enclosure here of the of the story George Benny Ken for a good 20 25 years was one of the biggest leaders lights of the name and claim it prosperity gospel movement in the United States and he became extraordinarily wealthy he's, he's worth about 50 million dollars from people giving him you know gifts and donations and he would preach that the Lord wants you to be rich he wants you to be successful and that a sign of God's favor is your wealth well Benny Hinn uh, under the influence of a nephew as you say who was an evangelical minister uh, who first broke, who broke with his uncle and then came back to his uncle, Benny Hinn recanted and repented. And he had several videos uh, that you can see on his Facebook page where he said that uh, I need to stand before God at the last day and in judgment. And what I have said is wrong. And I repent of these errors and lies. And since then, Benny Hinn has been, no, he's flamboyant. He, has healings he does stuff that uh you won't see at the 1030 service he has the, the most Hill. healing sports jacket you'll ever see and the and <laughs> well okay but this was 2019 the tr in nigeria the nigerian press this past week woke up to this fact somebody wrote a story and from an old story uh, uh, essentially saying this is new but then it got picked up on Nigerian social media Nigerian websites because the prosperity go gospel is burning brightly in Nigeria and it's it's a threat to the Anglican Church and to the Catholic Church because of the excitement and the allure of uh, God wants you to be rich God wants you to be healthy it ties into some pagan practices that, you know, you offer offerings to the gods or to the witch doctor and in turn, return for getting stuff that you want in this life. Yeah. And there was a problem with, within the uh, Church of Nigeria's diocese in the U.S. where they had a uh, suffragan bishop nominee who was fully into the name it and claim it uh, business. And they sat on that guy and he recanted and said he wouldn't say it anymore. But now that our, that this conversation that we've had in the United States, and for most of our viewers, uh, we would look at uh, Christians who believe in this name and claim it stuff as sort of rubes or dupes. Uh, so why is this an issue? Well, in Nigeria and in Uganda and in various other parts of Africa, with the horrendous poverty that they have and the low level of Christian catechism, um, 
this is a very infectious, aggressive disease. And it's now, people are now waking up to it on the social media level in Nigeria. Now, the leaders, Archbishop Henry in Dukuba, has uh, condemned this long ago. It's not like this will be news to the Church of Nigeria. No. But the culture is catching up. And I'm, no, it's not universal. Uh, not every got not you know not every prosperity preacher is saying I'm I'm wrong, uh, just as we still have uh, oh who's that who's that fellow uh, oh he's just went out of my head the guy with the Learjet that God wants him to have a Learjet not uh, like it starts coach. with K Ken something or Carl Kenneth uh, Kenneth yeah Kenneth. Ken uh, uh, we were going to say Kenneth Kieran, but no. <laughs> Sorry, no, no. That's uh, an Anglican insider joke. Yeah, but, oh my uh, gosh! Yeah. But um, the but the the point is that it is possible through consistency and and through the intervention of the Holy Spirit that these things can be cleansed from the church's life. Who would have thought that you know a two three year old story can resurface and actually start a movement in Nigeria to rid itself of this? of this evil, the prosperity gospel. It would be nice to see if that happened and if uh, Benny Hidd would uh, visit there and, and uh, solidify this new teaching, new teaching, uh, orthodox teaching on uh, your role in, in, the, in the, the realm of the kingdom. So, um, Kenneth Copeland? Kenneth Copeland. There we go. That's right. right. It's just, just like, oh, that fifty-five-year-old brain is just like, oh Lord. So, okay, good. I'm still. I got that that hospital fuzziness still going on. Um, what is our next story? Or was that the last one? Ac ac the uh, acne. The upper Midwest dies. Well, we were gonna do the migrants and Welby real quick. That could be a real oh, quick okay. story, and then we'll do the, the other stuff there. So, um, Welby, I. Uh, just can't can't be a uh, I'm not going to say that that's slander libel that we don't want to do that so um, we have news on Archbishop Welby George why don't you do a wonderful job and, and let us know what the news is with Welby in, in Rwanda well the Archbishop of Canterbury supported by his bishops has interjected himself into British politics again mm -hmm. And it's on an issue that is really not of much interest to people outside of the UK. Uh, the government has a new uh, policy they'd like to introduce to uh, sort of sort out asylum seekers seeking to enter Britain by using a third country as a place where they sort of sort them out. Uh, Australia has done this for years. Uh, they used to have, uh, they picked the Coast Guard to pick up the people in the boats and take them. Think, it wasn't Nauru, but it was one of Pacific sure. Island nations. That, yeah. and, the, and they'd have the camp, and then they'd sort of find out, are you an economic migrant? If that's so, back to Ceylon you go. Are you a genuine political refugee? Then welcome in. And Britain has the problem that the U.S. has of organized gangs trafficking people to the country. And they're trafficked from France and Spain and other European nations so people can get to Britain. And it's not for the weather that they want to get no. there. I think it's for the government benefits and all this and that. And so the British government is trying to stop uh, the gangs, stop the deaths on the high seas of people in small boats trying to make it to Britain. And once ashore, they can then claim housing and all these things. Well, the British government said we're going. We've inked a deal with Rwanda where we'll put these send these people to Rwanda and have the camps in Rwanda to sort them out. Justin Welby initially said this was horrible. It was against God's will. Jesus wouldn't do this. Um, I don't know why he would say that uh, because it's pure hyperbole. But some other bishops ch chiped in on that. Well, I, I, I don't want to say it's it's all hyperbole because the Bible is clear. What happens if I, as an individual, encounter a immigrant, illegal or not, how I should treat them? Okay. It it also says if the government wants to make rules, allow the government to make rules. So, yeah. Well, but it's it's 
it's a typical echo chamber thing. It if you only echo. talk to other woke people, mm -hmm. of course we want to have all uh, all the migrants we can, and let's not only give them welfare. Let's give them voting rights to make sure that they know who gave them this and That's right. and uh, you know bread and bread and circuses to the uh, to the the rabble, and that keeps the emperor in power. Well, but Boris Johnson, the prime minister, basically said, oh, God, Justin, shut up. Nobody listens to you. Or he said, and words to that effect in among the cabinet, and of course, this is leaked. And so church leaders express outrage about the Boris Johnson. And Welby doubles down with another speech saying the church must engage in political issues. The government or the, you know, the church? Because... The church. church must engage. Yeah, okay, well, the Church of England has, and nobody listens anymore. Because the, the Church of England, when you go to a moral issue, the Church of England has no voice. They don't say anything about moral issues, only political issues. Well, that's why the, 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 the television in the U, in UK will bring Gavin Ashton on to talk about a moral issue before they bring on any Church of England bishop. Because yeah. Gavin has something to say that is relevant and is pithy. Well, uh, it's funny. What, I think it was the Daily Express commissioned a poll, and the poll about after the latest back and forth between Welby and Boris Johnson, and the poll said, "Do you want the bishops to be in the House of Lords anymore?" And the majority said, "No way. Uh, we want spiritual leaders. We don't want politicians." who are unelected and appointed by a closed cabal of uh, like-minded people. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, the joke is, the only reason why the bishops are in the House of Lords anyway is that in the medieval period, the bishops were great landowners. And the great landowners, who the earls and the barons and all this and that. And they, they were, were in the House of But they were influential, perhaps. Yeah. They were influential because they had a quasi- they had the same status and property and power that the great barons did. Now they like to say, well, we represent the moral voice of the people in England, as if a politician can't have a moral voice on his own, only a Church of England bishop. Now, that's their country. Let them screw it up. But, uh, but my point is, uh, my disquiet with Justin Welby is that the more fights he picks, on these issues, and perhaps it's the manner in which he picks these fights, that Jesus says this is the only way, that this is the only agenda, uh, that you can't have a contrary voice. Because the Church of England system for choosing Episcopal, only one bishop was publicly opposed, or was publicly in favor of Brexit. Every other bishop said, oh, this is terrible, it's evil, it's awful, and you had all these over-the-top statements about hyperbole that were no different from the blather you see from the Guardian opinion pages. Well, the British people voted for Brexit. So what does that tell you of how out of touch? Is it because the British people are so pagan that they don't listen to their bishops? Or are the bishops so well, irrelevant? Both, because... Justin Welby wants to use Jesus and what Jesus taught as an example to a nation that is not Christian. That, you know, uh, Europe and England and the UK are uh, largely pagan. I'm sorry. You, you know, we, got this, we suffer from that here in America, too. It's not, you know, not something you guys are, are, are holding court on. But uh, in that reality, um, you need to be the example then Justin of what Jesus teaches, not just the proclaimer of what he teaches. And you're from my humble abode, you're not a great example of what Jesus teaches. Now, yeah. Rowan Williams was just as active politically, mm -hmm. but Rowan Williams did not clothe his words or his opinions in such naked political terms as Justin Welby does. Mm -hmm. Rowan Williams would start with a theological principle and then say a consequence is this issue, uh, is supporting this issue or opposing this issue. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was much more influential when the, Rowan Williams would do that uh, than anything that Justin Webby has ever done. Um, 
Well, what does that tell you? The, you and I are just cranks. And even though we filled out press credentials to go to Lambeth, and <laughs> we're probably the most experienced Anglican uh, reporters um, out there, we may not get to go because they have new rules. If you don't support the cause, you can't go. Even though I can recite the Nicene Creed and believe every word, uh, probably won't probably won't make the cut. We'll have to see uh, if we are allowed to be reporters. George, is that that's got to be everything? I think. What a long show. Um, oh, we, looking here. Did you want to do Acne too? The latest on that one? Yeah, because it's a quick story. We don't know. We don't know who to believe, but uh, there's more uh, press release or letters and statements going back and forth from uh, people that when I read it, I'm like, you're coming off as an activist, not a pastor in this letter. You're coming off as a, uh, a seeker of victims or, or your own victimhood. And so... We posted on Anglica.ic some letters going back and forth uh, with Acton 2 and the response to uh, some of us going back and forth. And I've not really put my head around it. That's it. We could do a whole show on Acton 2, but I find that we're probably not going to get any truth from what's going on yet until we get further down into some answers. Let That's me, how confusing yeah, it is. Let me, yeah. <clears throat> let me sort of flesh out what's going on. Okay. Um, we've reported in the past about the abuse scandal at, in uh, the Diocese of the uh, Upper Midwest of the ACNA, mm -hmm. where a lay, uh, lay catechist has uh, been accused of rape, and he's in jail waiting trial. And the accusation is that the parish and the diocese uh, uh, tended to cover up this. They didn't redeploy and hide it or anything like that, but rather they sought to preserve, uh, hush things up, is the accusation, and that they've not dealt fairly or honestly with the victims of the uh, abuse. And the ACNA uh, put uh, Bishop Stuart uh, Ruck on uh, leave put together a provincial response team to look into this and set up uh, Bishop uh, Miller, what's his first name, uh, Bishop Miller, to be an interim bishop while this is all worked out and have the ACNA do the investigations. Well, three members of the provincial response team resigned because they were not happy with how things were being handled according to their lights and these accusations are going back and forth. And if you basically boil down what the accusations are, separate from the abuse, is that one group of people are saying, you're not doing it the way we want to do it, so we're going to take our ball and leave the game. While the ACNA is saying, just let the process work itself through. Yeah. And so the ACNA cannot come back and tell us with deep insight, here's what's really happening, here's what's going on, because they have a legal process I have to follow. Now, am I saying that the ACNA is above reproach? No, I'm not. There's some dumb ACNA bishops. There's some stupid people out there who <laughs> screw things up. Yeah. But I'm not saying that this may be the case in this instance. Nobody is perfect. But I'm not really ready to... In the past, my practice, when I cover these abuse cases, and I've written about more abuse cases in the Anglican world than any other reporter ever, because I've been doing it longer than anybody else, I wait until the jury's verdict comes in. I'll announce that there is something, what the charges are, but I won't go a blow by blow until I don't do that. And then I just wait until the final verdict is in, everything's settled, we're done. This is the story. Because if you hop in in the middle... Um, <sighs> well, if you hop in in the middle, you make it about yourself and not about the news. Yes. I want... Yeah, and that's that's the big thing here. And that's what I see with... I hate to say it, with ACNA 2, is they're making this about themselves and not about the victims. They're making this mm -hmm. about the process they're not happy with and not about the victims. They're, they're claiming they're doing it for the victims, but... In my mind's eye, I, I and I, I say this as a half 
bald, little pudgy old guy on the other end of the webcam, it looks like you're just doing it to promote yourself. And the victims themselves have said, we don't support what ACNA2 is doing. So if I agree with the victims, maybe I'm on the right side here. And so I don't know, George, it's one of those things that I don't, I don't want to get involved because I, the second we do, we make it about ourselves and we don't like to do that. Um, so you're not going to, you'll see us put publish the public statements yeah. of the ACNA and some of the, the victim advocacy groups, but you won't see us doing independent reporting at this stage because it, it's the souffle hasn't risen yet. It's still it's in right. the oven cooking. It's still the oven. You know, now, now, if this comes out that, you know, bishops in the ACNA had screwed up, we absolutely report that. We've, you know, we've well, wouldn't, talked we would enjoy <laughs> reporting that. No, no, we don't enjoy reporting. Uh, uh, Kevin, people say that we love to beat up on people. Yeah, no. we don't. No, we don't. We, we, we want, at the end of each day, God to be glorified. We want this program to glorify God. And we want to church to, to grow. But we know that can only happen in an environment of transparency. And that's what this program does. And it can only happen in the environment of encouragement. And we encourage people through this program to c continue to stay involved and be aware of what's happening in the church and around the world. And we even talk about secular people like Elon Musk. Pray for him. Um, you know, there, there's a lot going on in these days where we are in the age of wars and rumors of wars and quakes and earthquakes and all that type of thing. Well, you know, <laughs> Is my anxiety speaking? And so it's just like, you know, please, people, uh, uh, you know, just stay aware of what's going on. And we're glad you watched the program. We're glad we've come to the end of another program. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 729 of Anglican Unscripted.